Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Today's podcast episode is proudly sponsored by Timo, the award winning app designed to support neurodivergent people just like yourself with routine and scheduling. Head to your app store and type TIIMO to learn more. Hello, listeners. Asperger's Legion. For... Welcome back to the 4040 podcast. How are you doing today? It is a very strange week for me because I've had a little bit of a, a bad bout of depression and I've also been feeling quite sick lately. Um, nothing, to, nothing too much to worry about, but I'm very glad to be here today to talk to my lovely guest, Lewis Oddy, who is a radio presenter. How are you doing, Lewis? I'm doing fine, man. How are you? Yep. As I said, like it's, um, it's definitely, it's definitely been a little bit tough this this past week or so. Is but I feel like my um, productivity and my my mood is steadily improving, which which is good, I suppose. So yeah, uh, would you like to give everybody a little bit of an introduction into who you are and the kind of stuff that you do? Yeah, I'd be glad to. So I'm Lewis Oddy. Um, and you got my you got my name right. I'm quite happy about that. We're off to a good start there. <laughs> but yeah, so I was a student at Salford University. I've now graduated. I'm in the real world now. Um, my hobbies, I, I love media. I love creating stuff. I love finding new things out and love gaming, love exercise. Basically, I love many things. Also going out, but I can't do that at the moment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so. I'm autistic, and I used to hate that really much when I was in high school, but now I'm beginning to kind of own it and appreciate it. And like a person in my documentary that I just created on autism um, said, it's kind of like a superpower, and I, I really do believe in that. I think it makes me me. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be on this podcast to talk about, you know, whatever you want to talk about. That's really it. So yeah. <laughs> Cool. So we got in contact through my friend Nick Ransom, who was actually on the um, podcast, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And I, he sort of got us in contact together and we had a little chat and he sent me uh, the project that you created around your experience with autism diagnosis. Hmm. You brought in some some people who are autistic to sort of give their views. And I think it was it was mostly... It was mostly focused around the diagnosis of, of you and the experiences that your your mum had as well going through that system. But I, what, what I really want to know is what made you want to create that piece? Like, was there any moments of inspiration that, that made you decide to do that? Or is it just um, something that you wanted to share? I guess the truth is... Um that I was looking to do a final project and basically I for the listeners I was studying a, a course I was studying a course called television and radio and I was more focused on the radio aspect so we asked for our final project which is the equivalent to a dissertation to have an idea and to make it into a radio documentary where we would mimic that of a BBC Radio 4 kind of one my my first idea for that was going to be on the oh god um is it? It's called something Island. Yeah, it it will come back to me. It's basically uh, is it erasure, erasure. No, it's it's where so the British government in the nineteen fifties, I think, and yeah, nineteen fifties, they were on nineteen fifties and sixties. They were testing hydrogen bombs and nuclear bombs, and um, my granddad got sent to this island um, with people from New Zealand and Australia and the British and that kind of stuff. And it was his national service. And I heard about the story of how they would drop the hydrogen bombs on, you know, the island. No, it's called Christmas Island. Christmas, Christmas Island. Island. That's what it's. 
Yeah, so basically, they were just human guinea pigs. And you can research this because it is quite interesting. And to cut a long story short, they didn't have adequate protection from the nuclear radiation blasts. And so, you know, they got cancer and they got Mm -hmm. all kinds of sickness. And since then, they've been trying to get funding and help from the government. Um, And I think every government, every country's government, apart from the UK's, has given help to these people. So it's still a big issue. And it still needs to be resolved in the UK. So I don't know why that's not happened, but oh well. Governments, Um, that's that's what governments are. (laughs) Well, what what made you want to create the project around autism instead of that? Um, It was just, it was very hard. All right. So it was very hard to get contributors willing to talk about their experiences and to actually come on and speak about it. So I had a helper at uni who was a special advisor. She was called Debbie. And she was in the documentary as well. She was speaking, and she said, "You know, she said, I think you should try and do another another one, get another idea to go." So I said, "I made it on my autism," and quickly she was telling me about the you know the advantages and disadvantages of it. But I was dead set; I wanted to create that, so I got to work on it. And well, the first thing I wanted to do was the history of autism, so like the research and whatnot. But yeah, let me tell you. There is a lot of research out there, which <laughs> it, it would be quite hard to fit that into a 30-minute program. Some of it's a bit dodge as well. Yeah, it is. Um, I don't look at that. I think that's, personally, I think that's very stupid. I, I only go on to them to laugh at them, <laughs> um, really. But basically, yeah, so I begin researching the proper history with like Hans Asperger, um, mm-hmm. Leo Kanner, Lorna Wing, and... Yeah, looking at the reports they did on children with autism in the forties and fifth, you know, forties and thirties, and then I went to Lorna Wing, and she was the person to put on like a proper auto, you know, scheduling kind of thing where a diagnosis program called Disco, mm-hmm. um, her and Judith Gold, yes, and basically I wrote kind of a script for that, and I recorded it and I put it in, and I was happy with it, so I carried on, found more contributors. And and yeah, um, can you hear that in the background? By the way, um, no. <laughs> All right, okay, that's good. Sorry, there's there's something outside, so I'm just worried. And um, but basically, so I found these three, four contributors who were also students of Debbie, um, Debbie mm-hmm. as well, my helper, what you want to call it. And she got in contact with them, and they came back. And one was Daniel, one was called Daniel, another one was called Aaron, another one was called Zach. Zach was a scientist. Daniel was a is well is still a student at UCLan doing a master's degree, and Aaron has just finished his degree at Bolton. Uh, no, not Bolton. Um, Oldham University in drama. I think drama, or dance, or theatre, mm. or something. A wide variety of topics. Yeah, it it was quite interesting to get a, a good mix of people because one of them was working. Zach was working in the science lab. Daniel was doing his master's, but he was also working at the same time for the university, and Aaron was kind of in the same position I was. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I schedule my interviews, I do them with them, and they all offer something unique. And then my, then it, it dawned on me, oh, my project has changed now. It's <laughs> now more about, you know, these people with autism and how they deal with the condition. So I tailored it more to that end. More towards the experience side rather than the the factual educational side. Yeah. And then it went to its final stage, the education. So I had a bit bit planned from the start where I was going to sit down with my mom and go through my education and things with her. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I realized, oh, I could get another person I know who's got a a son on the autism spectrum who's an auntie, my, my auntie, no, not my auntie. Yeah, my auntie, I think. No, not my auntie. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, my uncle my uncle's son let's just put it that way okay. um, he has autism and he's a young young child it's called toby and basically from there it's it it just it became more about education process and the good things and the bad things and yeah it, it I, I want then the history got scrapped a little you know got mostly scrapped got rid of that still have the script for that Mm-hmm. But end up getting rid of it because it was too long winded and I, in my opinion, boring. Kept the 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 part with Emma. She was speaking about Toby, my mom, 
then I had other educational people on it like Debbie. And then I I still wanted to have the part in with Daniel and Zach and Aaron. So mm-hmm. I did keep that in in the end and I uh I put that in the end and basically to say it doesn't matter what happens to your son in education. It doesn't matter that he has autism or she has autism. Look at these people here and you will see that they have not been beaten by their condition. They've owned their condition. And autism and they are basically they're them first and autism that and their autism is second, that kind of thing. So yeah. Okay. And I think it just came out like that. Um so I guess it, to sum it up, it's more of an educational, factual, you know, ed, it's it's focusing more on educational and diagnosis um issues of autism. But yeah. in my opinion, I would like I've gotten a lot of feedback on people's favorite bits and the one keeps cropping up is the ending with saying about their autism and talking about their autism. And I would have to agree because that is probably the most special part to me and I'm quite thankful for them to come on and tell me about that. I think um, looking looking at your your project as a, as a whole piece, it's, it's, it's not like a, it's not like a podcast. It's not like, it's very structured, but you've also got like quite, I feel like you've, you crafted the um, the storyline very well, and you sort of narrated it as you know the evidence was being put out and stuff. But it's interesting to think that <clears throat> that you sort of went when you were trying to put together your projects, you were going through basically the same sort of things that I was trying to do when I produced my documentary in terms of getting in con- contact with somebody who has a lot of autistic students and asking them to sort of. Um, go out and try and pick people up um, who could do it and I agree with you like it's it's so hard to find autistic people like it's it's not unless they're like openly about open about it and they um, parade it uh, across social media and stuff it's quite hard to nail down interviews and stuff I think definitely having someone there for me it sort of guide me and, and put me in contact with people made it a lot better as well. I think having that sort of personal experiential angle to any sort of media thing is quite important because it gives, it adds a, a side of humanity to it, you know, a relatability. And yeah, I, I think you're right. It's it's it was very hard finding those people, and I would not have found them if it was not for Debbie. Because I went on Facebook groups, yeah, only Facebook groups. I could have gone on message boards. So I don't think that would have been a bigger difference. But honestly, one getting into these groups is hard. Two, some of these groups, and I'll call them out on this, are ridiculous. So I came across a group with people with autism in it. And they wanted, they wanted money to be able to advertise a re- for research, for interviews, and that kind of thing. And I just thought to myself, how dare you monetize this? Like, mm. this is just ridiculous. So that really put me off. And, you know, half the groups out there is for mums and parents with children with autism. And I'm in one at the moment, and it's not, it's not what I was looking for. And the other half, are, no. you know, not that active. So it is hard to get that. So it's... I think you have to target it, like you say. You have to find people who have connections. It's almost for like anything, you know, of any interviewer or any person you want to interview. You have to mm. go through a, you know, different people to get that. I found that that Facebook groups tend to be they, they either tend to be incredibly toxic and horrible. So, you know, I'd see po- a lot of posts to do with um, it's, it's it's sort of. D- discrimination against non-autistic people that seems to be quite a a large rhetoric in the in the the groups that i've looked in Um, but there's also this this really strange group that i was talking to my girlfriend about um whether there are groups out there or pages that talk about being in a relationship with an autistic person and she found this group and she (laughs) <laughs> as soon as she got in, she read the description and it says, please do not let your autistic partner know that you are part of this group. Honestly, like, <laughs> it's it's literally just a hate board. Like, it's it's people saying that 
Autistic complaining. people can't be. Yeah, autistic people can't be empathetic. They're rude. They're, you know, they upset me a lot. And oh it's... yeah, oh you, you well, I guess to those groups and to those people in the group, um, one if you have anything to say, be be brave and say it to a person's face. Yeah. And if you're in a relationship, I guess the worst thing you can do is go behind someone's back and start back chatting them to a pe- to a random group of people mm. <laughs> on the internet and start complaining. It's it's ridiculous. I do find that ridiculous. It's just very disheartening. It's like it's not even a case of uh autism versus neurotypicals. It's just a case of people just being horrible to each other and talking behind the backs of a lot long standing partners it's if i found i had a partner in that group i would be very very i guess it would really ruin the relationship for me if it was long term mm. if it was long term i would kind of be like i'd kind of ask questions but this is me i'm very kind of not cold but i don't just i just don't take it you know if i see a bad person cuz i've had people i've was bullied in the past in high school Mm. And I know about human behavior, and I think this is probably to do with my autism. I'm very perceptive of people. Um, and even though I do think I am good natured and whatnot, I, I do get suspicious of people if they start asking weird questions or being a bit toxic or whatnot. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mechanism that you, that you form to cope with yeah. early life experiences. Like, I, think, I think we struggle innately knowing what a person's intentions are based on nonverbal communication as well. Like I think we have to have that sort of suspicion around people uh, to some degree just to sort of wheedle out the the nasty people. <laughs> yeah, in terms of those groups, I think relationships, I've seen it all the time. It's like, God, if if, if you're that concerned about dating a person with autism, then don't date a person with autism. You know, exactly. it's 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 ridiculous. Like it would probably save them more of a hassle. You know, because they have to deal with. You know, I think I've I've heard the word neurotypical as well. This is it's kind of coming to my vocabulary now, mm-hmm. and it's such a good word. I love it. And even though I don't use it to say it's us versus them, I do think neurotypical people. Ah, uh, you know they 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 can be a bit weird when you say, "Oh, I'm 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 autistic." They can get very kind of like, "Ooh, well, you know, like, okay, um, how do I deal with this?" It's a it's a subject that has a lot of tension behind it, isn't it? It's just yeah, anything to do with disabilities or differences, people are generally seem to become quite hyper vigilant when you start talking about it. When you meet someone new and you trust them. Do you share that you're autistic with them or does it take time? Because for me, I tend to tell people who I like. I don't tell everybody, but I tell people who I like. And sometimes that can bite me back, but other times it can be the best thing ever. I think um, because a lot of my work and my media stuff is centered around autism, it's quite hard for it not to come up in conversation. So that that means that I do have a lot of situations where I'll tell people that I'm autistic if um, if it comes out. Not necessarily going out with this express intention to, you know, put like a little sticky note on my head and make sure that everybody knows that that I'm autistic. It's um I think it's because when it, when I meet someone I, I try to make sure that they they get a good impression of me first and then once I tell them that I'm autistic, they already have this this view of me as you know, quite a socially competent person. And then I sort of challenge that with something that goes completely against it. So it's it's more of like a curiosity thing yeah. for other people. Not to say there haven't been difficulties when you tell people. Some people just don't care. Some people don't think it exists. <laughs> Some people try yeah. to tell you what autism is. And, but in general, it's it, it's been quite positive for me. But I guess it's just I've learnt to as you said, sort of discard people that are not nice mm. <laughs> and not open-minded. Sorry, do, do you think that your knowledge of being autistic um, in adulthood has sort of adjusted how you process things that have happened in secondary school? Yeah, I would say 
it's funny because I remember my brother always saying to me, you, you may be in a year, like year 11 or year 10, but you're probably like a year men- mentally, you're probably a year younger than these people or two years younger. And I would agree in that kind of regard because... Socially. Socially. Yeah, socially and, and that kind of stuff. <laughs> because I think it's weird because I don't know if this if this happens to you or anybody you've spoken to, but I feel like I've grown up. Like I'll just realize one day, oh, I've grown up a little bit there. Oh, I've, <laughs> I've, I could do this now. You know, when I was in year 10, I used to ask my mate Harry, you know, how do I be witty? Like that yeah. kind of stuff. And now <laughs> I am witty. And, and you know, it's, it's it's that kind of, I guess, not innocence, but cluelessness in a good way. I've not yeah. been not learning stuff at the pace where my peers were and catching up at them, which I think I have yeah. done now to a certain respect. Um, I think I am at this point a full function adult of society, whatever that is. But I, th- I think that uh, this, the strange thing about autism and, and some of the studies that I've read, it suggests that actually all autistic people communicating with each other, it ten- tends to work very well. It's just when a neurotypical tries to communicate with an autistic person where the um, the difficulties come in. There was this study that I'm talking about, I think I've mentioned it before in another podcast, but they, they sort of split group people into groups, autistic people in one, neurotypical in one, and then a mixed one. And this was all about sort of like social cohesion and social communication. And the neurotypical group did really well. But the funny thing was that they autistic group did equally well in these social communication tasks so it's kind of like <laughs> the only the problem came in where when it was the mixed group um, yeah and i think i don't think it's that we don't have social skills because we do tend to be quite higher in higher in iq and intelligence and a little bit sort of men- mentally sort of intellectually mature I guess dealing with groups of people, I if I'm if I know how to deal with a certain type of person, then I'm okay. Mm, and yeah, yeah. I've met people who are neurotypical who are just as quiet and even more quiet than me and don't know how to communicate better than me. Like communication to me, I can do that quite well. That's my strength. I'm very good at that. Mm. But at the same time, I've spoken to people on who are neurotypical who find it very challenging to speak. Mm. And I've had to, and this is, you know, this is quite ironic. A person with autism has had to, <laughs> you know, pry, pry the words out of them and, and yeah. you know, and Introduce it's like getting blood from a stone. And... Yeah, yeah, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. So we, we've, talked to, we've talked a lot about, actually, the, the intricacies of, of autism. And um, shall we get into the, the topic? Yeah. <laughs> about 40, 40 minutes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. <laughs> this happens a lot. Um <laughs> Probably one of the reasons why my podcasts are a bit too long. So, yeah, we're, we're talking about early diagnosis and try, trying to figure out what are the benefits and disadvantages of it. I believe that in the UK, you can, I think you can get diagnosed at around 18 months, something like that. It's very early that you can be diagnosed. But for ease, let's say, you know, anything below the age of 13 is an early diagnosis. So sort of prior to teenagehood. Do you think that having an early autism diagnosis um, was beneficial to you just as a, a standalone person processing the environment and socializing? Yeah, um, it definitely helps with understanding your limitations and, and what you find difficult and, you know, in terms of calculating the problems that you have and maybe linking it back to that. But, just, you know, sometimes that's not even the case. But yeah, I, I definitely, un- I, to a person out there, who is listening or whatnot, and they think they have autism, you know, get a check. Always get a check. If you think you have anything, get a check. Because what's the harm in not knowing? You know, in knowing, I mean, you know, mm. it, it, especially if you have a condition, you have a condition and that's it. And with parents, I think it's more difficult because some parents, they may see it and go, oh, you know, my son's not different. And especially if it's a newborn, if it's a young child and new parents, they, they don't want to be told that their son's different. They don't want to be told that their daughter or whatnot is got something that will affect them and you know put certain things on them so i from a parent's point of view and this is the thing that came from my documentary i understand how they feel and it's hard to deal with a child with autism at a young age but do you think that um going back to sort of your primary school and secondary school days do you think that 
Do you think that it helped at all with the the common things that autistic people struggle with, like socializing and sensory difficulties and differences? No, because when I was a child, I just ran around and played around, and a lot of a lot of people did that. <laughs> so I think in that regard, probably not. It's funny, but I think kids are just children are just children when they're younger, and they just want you know they mm. don't really care, and I firmly believe that and that kind of stuff. And yeah, children can be mean sometimes, but I. I never experienced that in my primary school. I loved my primary school life. It was it was a blast. It was fun. Um, it was only until probably later on in high in primary school, like when I was in year six, no, year four, year four, yeah, year four, that I got my diagnosis. And I don't remember much changed. I just got help her, what the school funded, and that kind of stuff. And mm. but at the same time, I think an early diagnosis is important because it can help your son advance or daughter advance onto. You know, just through the support. Yeah, a person's intelligence is a person's intelligence. A person with autism or any other condition could have a certain level of intelligence, and if they cannot reach that because of their autism or condition, then they need extra support. That would be my number one argument for why people should get an early diagnosis because it may be hard at the start and it may be difficult, but when years to come, it could set the child up for a good, you know, a good education. And good growth. Mm. It's interesting that you you say you said that you, personally or individually you didn't really. I, I get what you mean because I was diagnosed when I was ten, which I think is a little bit later than than yourself. Mm. But I was sort of told the difficulties and the sort of sensory stuff, and um, I was given a little bit more support on the social side from my parents and from my teachers and stuff. But it wasn't. It wasn't a case that I could really distinguish what the differences between myself and other people were, which I think is one of the sort of the the, the weird aspects of being diagnosed early, because you, you're confronted with things that you'll find hard rather than things that you'll find easy, and and so I guess that sort of leads us into you know the next question, which I know your your mother made a appearance on the audio documentary that you produced do you think that your diagnosis helped your parents understand you more and sort of offer you more tailored support it's a difficult one um my parents my my mum especially my mum my mum and my grandma they knew they knew my grandma knew something was not it was in my development all right i need to go back to the first part of the story (laughs) (laughs) all right so when i was born I was a healthy baby. <laughs> starting from the starting no, no, from the I'm, I'm, I, I don't worry. I won't, I won't go into every little major detail. I'll no, tell you no, about no. my birthdays and whatnot. But basically, <laughs> when I was born, I was all right, and then I got meningitis. I had suspected meningitis. Oh. I was quite ill. I was quite poorly, so I went into the Ooh. hospital. Came out. You know, you could imagine I was developing a steady pace, and then I had this, and then I came out, and I started to, in my mum's eyes, you know, I was not developing right then. It kind of just stunted. So I started hitting my head against the wall. I started showing behavior, behavioral problems, which were alarming to my parents. And mm. it was my grandma who said to my mom, you know, something's not right here. So she took me to a pediatrician. And this pediatrician, put it, can I put it bluntly or is there, you know, what kind of language can I use? Uh, basically, he, he was not very forthcoming to my parent, my mom. And he, mm-hmm. he, he lambasted her for having the audacity to bring me in. He said to her, oh, he's only he's just a late developer. You know, he, there's, there's nothing wrong with this child. When there wasn't anything wrong with me, but I had a condition. So, and it, it, it's kind of worrying how a pediatrician didn't realize that. Oh, well. But it was some time later when I was in year six, no, year four. I keep getting those mixed up. I don't know why. <laughs> um, that my teacher in my class noticed I had same kind of behavioral patterns as a student in the year before who was also autistic but he had a diagnosis so she thought okay all right i think he's got autism i'm going to tell his parents but at the school at the time and this is a, it's it's not i guess you can call it a conspiracy it's not the best conspiracy but it's still a conspiracy <laughs> Well, it's not a conspiracy. Basically, our head teacher didn't want to sacrifice the funding mm. that he got into help. You know, basically, the fun, it, the cost of having getting a tutor for me and the personal helper would come out of his funding. So he didn't want to do that. Yeah. So he wanted yeah. it all to be very hush hush. 
yeah, make of what you want that. Issue. Yeah, make of what you want that. But I, I, my, my opinion on it is it, it's not good, and I think it's to do more with the the, go- the government and how they kind of distribute the pay and whatnot. I think it's getting better, but then I've get I've heard that it's hard to get statemented now. So oh, probably it's, not. It's difficult with the place that I work with now. That- yeah. They're trying to scrounge some funding to yeah. basically just get me in to, to be that one-to-one support um, yeah. for an autistic kid. And they're finding it really, really difficult to fund it. Why? Is it, is it, has, it got, has it gotten worse, the process, or is it...? I think, like, it's not necessarily the process. It's just it's, it's difficult because, obviously, if they're, if they're not a special needs school and they've got someone in there who needs that support, they they do have to, you know, they have to pay someone a salary in order to, you know, teach them on, on top of the teacher's salary and the, all the kind of other the financial things. And there's not that much support for that. There's not that much government funding, even now. I thought there was, but um, it probably possibly could have changed. But yeah, that's the problem. I think you just hit the nail on the head and you've got experience with that. So yeah, clarify. So that clarifies it then. Um, but I mean... Yeah, so when when my teacher sat down with um, my mum and dad on parents' evening, she kind of said to them, listen, I, I'm, I can't say this to you out loud, so when this head teacher comes past, we need to keep it hush-hush and just talk about, you know, Lewis's progress. Normal stuff. But when he's gone, we'll talk about what I think needs to be done to help Lewis. Mm. And my parents kind of looked at each other and like, all right. And then she basically just went on, went on, then... The head teacher went past and she went, yeah, I think Lewis has autism because, and then she, and then my mum and dad were like, oh, what? And she basically went, yeah, I think he does because I had a student in my year before and he had the same, he was kind of the same and exhibit the same behaviours and, and whatnot. And then to cut it short, she basically said, go and get him, you know, go and get him diagnosed so you can get the funding there because you need it. Yeah. So, when I got myself diagnosed and, you know, will behold, I had autism. <laughs> I didn't know, but because I was just too busy being a child. But yeah, my parents knew and things. And I think it probably more relieved them because yeah. they wanted to know and they wanted to. Now they kind of understand, oh, that's why Lewis is probably not progressing as well and that thing. Wanted a name to it. Yeah. So I got the help I needed. I, I began reading. My reading aid improved a little bit and things. And, and yeah. And the thing is, what my mum and will always say is that she didn't expect me to get to the level I am now where I've just graduated. Well, not graduated, but I've just finished uni and that kind of stuff. She thought that I wouldn't be in a good shout in terms of my education and yeah. I would struggle. I'm glad that I defied it and I'm sure she is as well. But yeah, I think that is the reality of these parents who have children on the spectrum who are diagnosed young. They think, God, well, you know, what's going to happen? And that's completely understandable. Do you think that your your parents knowing that you're you're autistic helped help them sort of change their behaviour and approaches towards you at a young age? I honestly don't remember it. Um, my parents have always been loving. Don't think it would have mattered anyway. They helped my mum, especially she helped me out with everything. My grandma helped me out with my education and things. And my brother's been supportive of me, very supportive. I'm quite lucky in that regard that I have a great family mm-hmm. and a lot of, and i know a lot of people don't have that so i see it, you know I, I am blessed in that way so you think and that I'm, I'm sorry it was less less sort of on the tailored side and more just it would think it was just natural yeah it was very natural they didn't have to adjust their behavior for it it just kind of came naturally to them yeah I, i'll tell you something now because if you want to know a bit more how my autism was and i knew about it and the process is that i can I talk about my high school because that's where I would say my education properly, my autism, my education properly collide and maybe the trouble started from there. So when I got to high school, at first I was, you know, I was in year seven, my brother was there, he was in year 11 and I was all right. You know, it was hard to, it was hard to fit in. Mm -hmm. And it was only until like the second week or the first week that I was in, like, and you know, the four days that I was there that I got... I got invited down to this thing called the Impact Zone, where children with disabilities or conditions or learning difficulties, that kind of stuff, hung out. Oh. And I felt at home. 
I felt at home there. I, I could get along with like-minded people. I could do my own things. I could play my games. And I was happy. I was quite content. But I still, but I was becoming more and more aware that I was a bit different to everybody else. Yeah. So one minute I was really, I was like, um, what do you want to call it? I was, I was still innocent and I still thought, you know, I'll be able to play around and I'll be able to do this. But as you get older, people start to develop more intricate personalities and become different people and different yeah. groups. And it's just natural. So high school is bad enough for everybody. But imagine if you're autistic or if, you're, if you've got something that people fi- think is wrong with you, then it, even, it gets even harder. It's, it's sort of like co- comparable to moving from somewhere in like Southeast Asia into the UK and not, not really understanding the culture and stuff. Yeah. My close mates didn't come to the same high school as me. I was the only one. So that was hard in itself. So I had to literally make new mates off the bat. Mm. And I didn't speak to the, my close mates for about three years in high school. Like I went three years about speaking to Harry, Will and Adam, who are my close mates now. And it was only until, actually, I've known, I think Harry, I spoke to Harry in year nine and eight. And I think that's when I got back in touch with him. But with Adam and Will, it was mostly in like year 10 yeah. and 11 that I started to speak to them. And basically, ever since then, we speak to each other all the time. But back then, it was hard. But in high school, there is a lot, I guess to sum it up, it was a lot of challenge. It was a challenging, difficult it's just trying to find yourself. It's trying to understand yourself. But it's it's also trying to, just make sense of what's happening. Hmm. But you just get on with it, I think. I think I just got on with it, like I got on with my studies and whatnot, and I tried to just keep my head down and not get into any, many tr- much trouble and whatnot. And yeah, I got bullied in my first couple of years there, but that stopped after a while because I just ignored them and they got bored, you know. And, uh, and in year 10, 11, it was all fine. I was like... That's good to hear. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's one of those... It's very difficult to put into words, but I guess that's as you know best as I can do. Um, with did, it. did your uh, autism diagnosis give you um, much support when you were in secondary school, like with the teachers? Oh yeah, and, oh, yeah definitely. And it was it was great. It was it was great. I we had TAs in every single class I was in. I mean, it was probably the best. Truly, some wonderful teachers I had. He really helped me understand my condition and really catered to my needs and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. But I know for other schools, it is hard. And that was that was probably... It is the realities of where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're at a school where they don't have many children who, are on, who have that condition or, you know, they don't have that support network in, God, I, could, I, could ima- I couldn't imagine how difficult it must be. Yeah. You can, can you imagine being... You know, like forty years ago, going to a public school, like yeah, yeah, exactly, be, be um, exactly, mate. Um, <laughs> and that's it, isn't it? It really is. Like, forget forty years ago, twenty years ago, or yeah. for, you know, like probably early nineties, even. Like, yeah, God, it is that lost generation of people with autism, and that's something that's always intrigued me. When I when I started my project on autism, I was going to do a bit about those people, but I wonder how they feel. Mm. God, they've had to get through life without diagnosing, without the support, and yeah, it's very difficult for them. I've had, I know a lot of people from doing me YouTubing and stuff who are sort of in their fifties, sixties, only re- only starting to learn about autism, and then and then going for like a diagnosis. And it's 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 a weird one because they they're not in the best place. They don't have a lot of friends. They're quite isolated. They didn't have very good experiences at school and with the parents mm. they do have that sort of i guess more more of that stoic attitude that you develop just from having to deal with stuff you know i can't imagine what it would be like for them like i, I reckon that it would just be absolutely terrible like you wouldn't have you wouldn't have any friends in the teachers you wouldn't have any friends around you your parents won't be completely clued up on what's going on it must be an absolute hell you would have to have a special person like Lorna wing yeah, who, I don't know. If, uh, do you know about Lorna Wink? Yeah, in yeah. Like, in my doc, I, I mentioned her in my documentary. The yeah. child of impairments. Yeah, yeah. Um, you would have to have someone like her, <laughs> who managed to be a caring, understanding, and you know, thoughtful parent in the time when 
that was not the norm. So, but I think now we're getting to a place where everyone's becoming a bit more accepting and want to understand more about different conditions and how it can cater to those people because we can't just shoe in these people, like people like you and me and other people like you've had on the podcast and and whatnot. A disability or a condition doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to achieve what you want to achieve. Mm. It, it's, it's just something that you deal with and something that's a part of your life and which dictates how you may work or have a routine and that kind of thing. But that's it. You can still have relationships. You can still be with people. You know, you're not this alien. So it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors, Timo. If you love visual support in your scheduling, Timo is for you. The app was designed for people with ADHD and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work. Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www.timoapp.com or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Thanks so much to my Patreon supporters, Patrick Vedi, Mol McCarty, and Julian Marks, of course. All of this support means so much to a little podcasting dreamer like myself. Anyway, let's get back into the show. So you you did get quite a bit of support in, in schools and stuff. In terms of like the workplace environment, you know, when you did your stints at the radios, did they yeah. put any sort of reasonable adjustments in place oh, no. for you? No. And you, did you need them? I told them that I was autistic. Mm-hmm. They just didn't care. And that's true. That's a sad truth. But it wasn't a big company. It was more of a small company. And I think they thought they probably could get away with that. If it was that bigger company, then there would be those adjustments there. And that, I would say that is probably the danger of working for small companies um, when you have autism and whatnot. You know, it can be quite challenging to get the support that you need. Yeah. And I found that. So, yeah, I will, I will say that it was challenging. But then I've been to other companies where, other places where, you know, you put down your autistic and they have reasonable adjustments and, you know, they, they cater for you and they help you and you can go to your manager and be like, and they'll be understanding. Um, I think it's accountability accountability at the end of the day. Mm. And I think you need that in a company or else people won't care and they'll just kind of forget about it and they'll forget about you. And so I guess in that way, just try and choose wisely. Or if you can't, just you have to kind of just deal with it and just take it on the chin and find something better. And that's what I did, I think. You definitely need that experience. I think it, it, it really does depend on, on who is around you like having a good workforce or good team or a good manager any one of those things is always going to trump you know being able to wear you know noise cancelling headphones or something if someone's genuinely kind and wants to listen to you and will try and help you out as much as possible it doesn't matter that you whether you're autistic or not If, if you just tell them that you struggle in this area in this area and then you go to them you know, with your thoughts and, and try to work things out and then they're a nice person, then it's it goes swimmingly. It, it can be the opposite for other people as well. Yeah, of course. Like, I think some people, it depends how you are really. And that's the same, you know, just, just because you have autism doesn't you want to be like me or you. It, you know, you could be a person who wants to work on their own and wants to do things on their own. I think my mum said this to me a couple of times about how people on the spectrum normally work by themselves and have their own business. And I can understand that because, hey, you know yourself, you know your work. Might as well just, you know, go out there out there on your own and make some money. You know, mm. not work for the man and uh, that <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, but I guess it's harder if you're doing like what me and you are probably doing, like me and you. And, you it know. goes against the grain like of what people are seeing autism is about. Nobody expects yeah, it, expects an autistic person to be very social and to enjoy speaking to people and enjoy being on camera. Oh yeah, it's it's quite funny that is. Um, they expect us to be like desk jockeys that are really good at coding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like 
even though I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> if hey, if I'm with a good group of people, I can have a laugh. I'm, I don't care. Yeah. Like, um, it's the people you work with, and some people I can get along with really well, really fine. But others I can't. Mm. Um, and you can have the best job in the world, but if you're with rubbish people, then you're with rubbish people, and that always puts a damper on it. But hey, I guess in the workplace, try and go to a place. I guess my advice would be. Tell them you're autistic, and this is a good thing. Tell them you're autistic, and it, it, see how they react to it. And if they react bad to it, meaning that they don't acknowledge it or they kind of brush it aside, then you know. You know how you're going to be treated. You know what's in store for you. But if they start asking you questions about it, and they start saying, oh, what would you need then? Then you know then. Yeah. It's being smart with these things. You have to play a game, people. You do. Playing the game doesn't mean that you have to settle. God, no. If you don't like somewhere, you know. Look for somewhere else. Just, yeah, go somewhere else. So one of the difficulties with raising autistic children is figuring out how much you need to protect them from things they'll find difficult. Like social atmospheres, like different sensory experiences. But you've also got to give them enough room to grow and get used to those difficult things because or else they'll just be a bit sheltered and not really have the life skills. And then again, I suppose some people are traumatized by that sort of constant exposure. Um, if, you know, parents don't take into account the difficulties. And then on the flip side, people can become dependent on people pulling up their negatives and, and stuff like that. But whether it's your own personal account or the experiences of other autistic people, do you think there are any negatives to being diagnosed early? Um, personally, no. From a practical sense, if you, pers- you if you need support, you need support. So there's no point hampering yourself. Or and this goes, I think this is for the parents. Obviously, this is probably more to the parents. There's no point hampering your child or trying to protect your child, but because you think that they may have a condition. It's like this: if if your child had um, an infection. Would you just leave it there because you're worried that, you know, it could ruin their life if they get treated for it? It could make them, you know, poorly or whatnot. It's that, that's probably not the best example, but you get what I mean. Yeah, I do. But basically, yeah. you need, if you suspect something, then you need to get that nipped in the bud. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So I guess on that topic, yeah, I, I can... I think if if you are a parent and you want to shelter your child who may have autism because you're worried about what the outside world is, then the only thing I can say, and this is from a person with autism, the world's a scary place and your child's going to see a lot of stuff. Um, and it's going to be upsetting at times, but it's also going to be wonderful at times. And, you know, everybody's everybody has their own personality. Having that child grow into someone unique and responsible and take care of themselves is the best thing and you're not going to get that if you shelter your child from the outside completely agree with you you can protect them you know obviously as a parent every child every parent every good parent sorry wants to protect their child and wants to have the best for them so i always see it like if i had a child i would do funny things like you know when they're younger teaching them how to get the bus yeah. that kind of stuff mm. You know, it's doing stuff like that, like teaching, being there as a guide to teach your children what to expect and then let them do it by themselves. And, you know, it, it, won't, it won't destroy them. It will be scary for them, but they'll get used to it. It's like anything. They'll just get used to it. Get a taste for it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've always, I think I've always, in myself, I've always been quite adventurous. So I would just walk everywhere. I love going to new places. So I'll, I'll go to anywhere, basically. When I used to go to Salford Uni, I used to go from... My, I used to walk from my house to the station, which is about 20 minutes away, 30 minutes away. Then I used to get the train to Manchester, which is 40 minutes. I used to walk from Manchester all the way to Salford, which is another 40 minutes. You know, I, I, and then from doing this, though, I know Salford, like the back of my hand. I know where how to get to Media City. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Learning how to, um, what's the Navigate word? The Learning world. how, yeah, yeah that learning how to do that is the best thing for a person with autism you want to be comfortable then why why not be comfortable in your surroundings Mm. i think if if you know for any parents who are listening to this out there the best thing to do is to let them experience things that everybody else does 
other kids do. Get let them get an experience of socializing with bad and good kids and just be, being able to just be there on the sideline for if they need some help. Yeah. Is always the best and you know giving them the encouragement. And you know if they they are having panic attacks about certain things, try and ease them into it rather than just not doing it. It's very much a slow growing kind of process, but I think it's quite important to to have those aspects. I think that's that's one of the difficulties when comparing the positive and negatives of mainstream and SEN schools, you know, mm. SEN schools, <clears throat> the more tailored, the more tailored to the autistic experience, there's more people who are, who are autistic. But then again, when they leave that school, they're going to be in the big wild world and they, they may not have the experiences that are needed to live independently from it. And so finding that balance, isn't it? Yeah. From what you're saying, it sounds like, you know, your parents did have that kind of supportive, encouraging kind of role in your life. Yeah. And I would also say as well, um, what what kept me going, even when I was going through bad times, is having a good group of mates that I could speak to, that I could go home from school, maybe a bad day of school, and just get on the Xbox and just chat to them. Yeah. You know, having that was really good for me. And this is probably going on to the next things I would say is um, if you're a parent and your child has autism, get them involved in clubs from a young mm. age. Get them involved yeah. in social clubs, sports clubs, anything. You, they'll form friendships. And that's the thing. If you form friendships with people, it doesn't matter if you're autistic or you're dyslexic or you, you know, you've got a disability. People, people like each other. People, there are good people in this world. So if you go, to, let's say you're in primary school, you've got a child involved in karate and in, in football and every other sport going, they'll get to high school and they'll be quite popular. And because they've learned how to socialize, they've learned those skills and that kind of thing. You know, it may not happen like that. You know, it, it may not be like that, but that could be a possibility. But you don't know until you've tried. So I guess in that regard, don't be hesitant as a parent to protect your child from the outside world. Get them involved in clubs, get them involved in social groups. That way they'll become more, you know, sociable. Graded exposure. You have to do it in a way, you know, you have to do it in a way that the, the child responds well to it. Because if they don't respond well to it, then it's not for them. So you have to find something else. Yeah, one of I think one of the the difficulties the you know like we were talking about sort of the the negatives of early diagnosis and I think for me I, I would agree with you. I think it's overall been a a positive thing. The thing is, I didn't really get much support in secondary school. From what I can remember, it was more just the ability to go out of class and sit in a quiet place if I needed to, and I think. Because, you know, when you're a teenager, you're stuck in your own head. You're in this weird social world and everything's new and exciting and different and interesting. And so you don't really have enough time to sit back and think about autism. Mm. And it was it was only until I started going to uni that I really started learning more about it and improving myself. So I guess, although it has been helpful... I think most of the help was just my parents understanding me a little bit more. I remember Nick saying about, and and quite a few other people saying that, you know, sometimes being diagnosed later on, you, know, you don't know what to expect. You don't know what's going to be difficult and you just go about life and, and you get through things. And then you sort of get diagnosed later on and you, you look into it a little bit more. You know, that, that could be good. I think, think the, the, the difficulty with early diagnosis can be that sort of sheltered perspective, that, that overly, overly nurturing kind of side to it. I think that could be one of the, the difficulties with it, especially for parents who don't really understand autism too much or, or have a negative view of it. But yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's, it's a good idea to get diagnosed early if you can. And even if you, you, you are past that and you're past all the secondary school, knowing that you're autistic allows you to look back on your past and process things in, in a different way and sort of grow in that sense and get a more rounded picture of who you are. So I think, yeah, def definitely 
Don't get diagnosis early. It's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that with an autism diagnosis at a young age, do you think that it had much of an effect on how you process the sort of social and, and sensory stuff? Did you find any of the sensory stuff difficult? And It's a weird one with um, sensory because... I'm starting to understand what sensory, you know, the word sensory means and how it relates to autism. Because sometimes things can get a bit overwhelming when too many people are nearby or, you know, there's something going on and you're not, you don't feel comfortable about it. Like today I was going to get in some fish. And because I've never done it before, it was quite a stressful situation to get that fish because, yeah. you know, I had to queue up, I had to choose the fish. I don't know anything about fish. I don't even eat fish. I was doing it for <laughs> my parents. So it was quite difficult. And in that regard, that was a lot of sensory overload now. I couldn't get I couldn't I couldn't wait to get out of that situation. Yeah. Um but when I was younger, I probably did have sensory overload. I probably couldn't cope with some, you know, too many things going on at once. And I didn't like being in massive groups of with massive groups of people. That would always stress me out and it kind of still does in a way. I don't know how to deal with large groups of people. So in that regard, when I'm at parties and whatnot, I can get a bit, or when I'm out clubbing, it can get a bit stressful sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I would say in that regard, with autism, there comes a certain um, certain thing with having that sensory overload. And yeah, I think it's just the best way how you deal with it. Yeah, I think knowing that you're autistic and uh, being able to pick apart situations that are too overbearingly difficult and and you know, type of situations that cause you meltdowns, having knowledge of those situations and a reason for why you find it difficult can be extremely helpful. But brilliant. But thank you so much for sharing your experiences and stuff. Yeah. Could I ask you to give me three main things that you want people to take away from the podcast? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess the first one is if you're a parent listening to this, get your child an early diagnosis of all to you know get if you have suspicions get your child diagnosed it is the best earliest if you can do it as early as possible it's then it sets up the you know different things in place the help in place to help your child progress in school and education and that is the most important thing in my opinion mm -hmm. socially as well i guess number one number two socially is don't shelter your child because they have a condition Get your child involved in the world, get them out there into different clubs, meeting different people. That will help them progress socially and it will make the, the world a bit more bearable. And uh, I think that's the key word because the world is unbearable and you just need to make it a bit more unbearable. Um, and thirdly, I guess, well, just keep listening to this podcast because, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very good. And if you have autism, and I'm going to be certain doing this. I probably will share this um, podcast around because it is it does offer quite a good insight into different people on the spectrum and how they feel about the condition, their own unique experience. So yeah, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you very much for coming on. And now we've got the last question, which I ask all of the autistic people that come onto the podcast. And it's a very open question. What does autism mean to you, Lewis? Oof, uh, I've asked this before, <laughs> but it's difficult to answer. Um, autism to me means confidence and confidence in, in being yourself and taking on the world, going about it in an, in an autistic way, which is funny to be, you know, it's funny to be, to do it and it's amusing, but it's also, you know, it's also very good for yourself and not being afraid to have autism. Because it is one that it is something that I'm proud to have, and I I love it. It makes me me, and yeah, that's it. Or, so yeah, I guess it would be autism is that person, and it makes that person who they are. And yeah, that's 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 it really. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. It's always interesting to see what people have to say about it, and I think um, it's it's hard to really pin down what autism is. I think, you know, it's, it differs very differently for, for people, maybe just based on their personalities and their experience, but um, it's always interesting to hear other people's views on it. Um, so thank yeah, you for that. No, thank you very much. So, yeah, if are there any links or 
you know, social media links or project links that you want people to see or hear about or watch? I guess, um, you know, my documentary on autism, that'd be, you know, I guess this relates to this. So if I could send you that over and whatnot, then yeah. Social media wise, I'm not really that big on social media, so probably not. So it's called Autism Meets Autism by Lewis Oddie. So yeah, go and, go and listen to that and uh, tell me what you think about it. And I hope it is quite insightful and pleasure listening to and teaches some people about certain things. And is there any way that um, if someone wants to contact you and ask you a question, and do you have any um, any way that they could do that? Yeah, um, I ha- my email address. So if you ever want to get in contact with me, then send me, you know, a line or something um, at Lewis Oddy. Uh, so that's L U I S O W I nineteen ninety eight at gmail dot com. And if you ever, if if you just want to talk about anything autism related or ask me a question about it, then yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd I'd, I'd love to chat about anything. But yeah, I guess that's the way you could get in t- contact with me. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. I will put those down Thank in the, the description. Thank you very much. So, of course, you can find the 40 OT podcast, as always, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts. And if you want to check out some of the videos that I've done, I've got a whole series of behind-the-scenes content for the documentary that I released, Asperger's in Society. And that's over on the Asperger's Growth YouTube channel, if you want to go check that out. But you can also find it on the AspergersInSociety.com website. As I said, I'm sort of in a little bit of a, a low mood period. So it's I haven't been the most productive on social media. But I do generally make a lot of updates on how things are going over on my social medias, which are all at Asperger's Growth, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Very easy to find. But yeah, this is, uh, I think this is, probably about the 24th episode that I've done and I'm, I've only released the 15th one so I've got quite a few to uh, edit and, and get through and stuff but thank you very much to li- for listening to me and Lewis talk about early diagnosis been very great to chat to you Lewis and I'm excited to see you know what kind of stuff you do in the future around sort of radio and media and stuff yeah should be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, mess me and, and let me know how, how that goes and what kind of progress you know, you're making on that stuff. I will do, man, and I'll probably watch your documentary as well because that seems quite interesting. And yeah, yeah, maybe um, get together on RuneScape. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's that's it. Uh, that's no thing as well, people. If you want to have a, if you want your son or daughter who's autistic to have a good time, get them on RuneScape. It's very relaxing. <laughs> And there's a lot of us on it. I can tell you that for now. <laughs> yeah. We were sort of joking prior to the podcast about doing a documentary on the link between autism and RuneScape. Um, <laughs> hey, I think it's a good idea, that. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> oh, my God. But it's been, it's been great, actually, because I, I'm not the most avid reader, but I've actually found that if I play a little bit of RuneScape and do a little bit of mindless tasks on there and listen to an audiobook, it seems to seems to work for me. So if, if you're finding that you're finding it hard to read, try doing something like that. Try play a mindless game and listen to a, po- listen to a podcast or a book or anything like that. It can be a good way to expand your knowledge, but also keep, you, keep yourself motivated to uh, continue reading. But yeah, f- thank you very much to everybody who's tuned in for this episode. And thank you very much, Lewis. Stay safe, everybody. Have a great day or a night or a sleep or whatever. Um, hydrate yourself, of course. <laughs> Hashtag hydrate the Aspies. And yep. <laughs> I'll see you in another episode in about two weeks, hopefully. See you later, folks.